Hi, I'm Carla, with, and today we're going to be talking about Castle of Lure by Lloyd Alexander and what this young adult fantasy novel can teach us in this time of just incredible turmoil. But before we get started, a little bit about this channel. Here we share good thoughts about good words. And on Fridays, I host a live Bible study on Instagram at Race to Walk. And then I publish two videos a week. So I publish a, a video about books and I also publish the Bible study. So if you are interested in any of those things, be sure to like and subscribe so you can get updates of notifications of new videos. So a couple of weeks ago, I did a video on my TBR for May. And uh, I had just mentioned that I was just, what I was saying was just so discouraging and there was just so much acrimony and animosity about, you know, the shutdown orders and differences of opinions about, you know, the virus and everything and I just, I just needed goodness and something that was happy to read and I just didn't want to be reading anything heavy. So I have been asking some of my friends for suggestions and one of the, the writers they suggested was Lloyd Alexander, who I had never heard of, never heard of him. But he wrote young adult novels, so I requested his books through Libby, and the first one that came through was this book, uh, The Castle of Lair, Lair, which is the third in his Chronicles of Predane series, and I was thinking, should I just start right in the middle or what? So anyway, I did, and it's it's a, it's a actually a fun story. It's an adventure story. You know, the hero of the story is Taryn, who is the assistant pig keeper, who is a companion of a princess, and I haven't read the first two books, so I don't know what happened there, but in this book, she's being um, going to another kingdom, and unbeknownst to her, there are there's this plan to marry her off to the prince of the kingdom, which is Prince Ron, who, and he's kind of like, sort of like this uh, friendly, bumbling fool a little bit. He's not that smart, not that bright. Um, and Taryn's kind of like, uh, you know, you're a little bit, you know, he's has a little bit of a resentment towards him because he feels like Rune really doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't measure up to, um, he doesn't deserve what he has. And so he, there's this, he has a spare in his story. So the princess is stolen away by this, this evil that they thought that they had conquered. And so Taryn and his, uh, his friends and Prince Rune go out and they're, so they, they send, send out a party to go and find her and rescue her. So that's the whole arc of the story. But in this story, I want to focus on one particular, because this is what really stood out to me. So Rune, again, not the sharpest tool in the shed. He gets lost. He gets separated from everyone else. So Taryn and his crew, they had been tasked by the king to keep an eye on him because, you know, the king knows that his son really isn't that sharp. So they're, they're spending all night trying to find him. And they finally find him in this, what seems to be an abandoned cottage. They find a book that is by this person named Glue, who is chronicling his attempts to become bigger. So what they determined is that this person, Glue, was very small, and he wanted to be bigger and to be respected. And so he tries to find a way, a potion, you know, to a way to make himself big. This big cat comes back, and they they find out that he was actually successful. In the process of escaping from this cat, they fall into this cavern. They encounter this person, Glue, and realize that he was actually able to make himself bigger as well. But because of this very largeness that he wanted, he's now trapped in this cavern, can't get out. There's an offer to help him escape, and they're going along thinking he's going to show them the way out. But instead of showing them the way out, Glue traps them. So they're there trapped, and they're having a discussion about what to do. And Ruin says, I can guess what you're thinking. Ru Ruin says in a low voice, it, if it hadn't been for me, you wouldn't be in this plight. And I'm afraid you're right. It's my fault things turned out as they did. I can only ask your forgiveness. I'm not the cleverest person in the world, Ruin added, smiling sadly. Even my old nurse used to say I was all thumbs. But I hate being a blunderer. It's not what people expect of a prince. I didn't ask to be born into the royal house. That at least wasn't my doing. But since I was, I wanted very much to be worthy of it. If you want to be, you shall, Taryn answered, suddenly and strangely touched by the Prince of Mona's frankness and not a little ashamed of his own unkind thoughts about Ruin. I ask you your, your forgiveness. If I envied you, your rank, it was because I believed you held it as a lucky gift and took it for granted. You speak the truth. For a man to be worthy of any rank, he must first strive to be a man. And then they're discussing glue, you know, they're the, the giant. And so this is the bard, or the wannabe bard that's commenting on this. I don't know, answered Fluter, from all the giants I've seen. Yes, well, the truth of it is, I've never seen any myself, though I've heard enough of them. Glue seems rather, 
how shall I say it? Small. I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but he was a feeble little fellow to begin with, and now he's a feeble little giant. And very likely a coward. I'm sure we could fight him if we could reach him. Our biggest risk would be stepping out and get on and getting squashed. So they're trying to decide what to do. And so then, you know, Glue comes back in and he's justifying himself and he's explaining how he got to be where he's at. Um, and the reality is that Glue's problem was never his size. Okay, so he's he's justifying himself here. You're not listening, cried Glue, who had been talking on at some length before, realizing he was talking mainly to himself. Yes, it's the same thing all over again, he sobbed. Even if I'm a giant, no one pays me any mind. Oh, I can tell you there are giants that would crack your bones and squeeze you until your eyes popped. You'd listen to them. You can be sure, but not Glue. Oh, it makes no difference to shout about him, giant or no. Glue the giant, queued up in a wretched cave, and who's to care? Who's even to see? So, and then he he talks about, you know, his life and how he got to this point. He had wanted to be a bard. He wasn't the years of study, explained Glue, in a voice that would have been forlorn had it not been so loud. I know I could have learned if I'd taken the time. No, it was my feet. I couldn't bear all the tra tramping and wandering around from one end of priding to the other and always sleeping in a different place in the change of water and the heart robbing blisters on your shoulders. And then after failing as a, a warrior and a bard and a hero and a king, because he wants to be all of those things, he decides to be an enchanter, a way to cut short, to become a thing without actually, without the cost, right? And he wants the show without the substance. And so then he, he says, uh, what else could I do, moan glue, sharing his, his head, shape, shaking his head miserably. What was left for me but to try enchantment? And at last I came upon a wizard who claimed to have a book of spells in his possession. He wouldn't tell me how it had fallen into his hands, but he assured me the magic it held was the most powerful. I had, it had once belonged to the, the house of Lair. He's going after this thing, you know, he wants, he wants the, the facade without the cost. He, you know, he's so focused on himself. He's now devolved into a murder to try to save himself. And this actually just did a, um, a chat with Chrissy Lewis at Dojo Essie in Space on the uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. And it's just, this is the same, Glue is actually the same character arc as Frollo in the Hunchback of Notre Dame. This is a, a passage of Glue really trying to bring these adventurers into agreement with his plan to kill one of them. Okay, please, please try to understand, return Glue's voice. It's my only chance. I'm sure it will work. I've thought about it I've thought it over carefully ever since I've been in this awful hole. I know I can brew the right portion. I have all I need except one thing, one tiny little ingredient. It won't hurt you a bit. You won't feel a thing, I swear it to you. Taryn gasps in horror. You mean to kill one of us? There was a long silence. Finally, Glue's voice reached the companions again. It sounded as though Glue's feelings had been hurt. You make it sound so, so raw. Great Beelins shouted Fluter. Let me get my hands on your scrawny neck and I'll make you sound raw. There was another silence. Please, said Glue faintly. Try to look at it from my side. Gladly, said Fluter. Push away that rock. Don't think it's easy for me. Glue went on. I'm fond of you all, especially the little fuzzy one. And I feel dreadfully about the whole thing, but there's no chance anyone else will step down here. You do understand that, don't you? You aren't angry. I'd never forgive myself if you were. Even now, he added plaintively, I don't know how I'll even bring myself to pick out one of you. No, no, I can't. I haven't the heart. Don't ask me to put myself through that torment. No, you shall decide among you. That will be the best all around. Believe me, Glue continued, it will be worse for me than for you, but I'll shut my eyes so I won't see which one of you it is. Then after it's over, we'll try to forget about it. We'll be the best of good friends. Those of you remaining, that is. I'll lead you out of here, I promise. We'll find Lylan. Oh, it will be good to see her again, and all will be well. You know, as I, I was reading that, you know, the thing that um, struck me is that Glue had, had been so self-focused that he really, and, and focused on his own needs, that he really had, was completely unable to see himself. But that's actually true of all of us. We can't, we can't see ourselves clearly, and that's why we need the Holy Spirit to convict our hearts and to lead us out from this selfishness and this callousness. You know, we have this incredible ability to deceive ourselves. 
And then David, in Psalms 51, um, verse 10, David writes, Create me a clean heart, O God, and renew a loyal spirit within me. Don't banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. And in another Psalms, he said, Lord, keep me from lying to myself. Because we all do that. We all lie to ourselves. It's the same thing as in uh, C.S. Lewis's Till We Have Faces. Um, And glue was even as cowardly and self-focused as he is, he saw himself as a victim. He couldn't see clearly. And I think that that is what we are seeing today. We are seeing, you know, what is the divisiveness? We think that what we, what we experience and what we understand is all that there is and that we can't, um, if we can't ever see beyond it and, you know, see how it might look from somebody else's perspective to really put ourselves in their shoes, you know, that's what we're going to say. We need to have the Holy Spirit convict us because this is something that I think is especially true among Christians. You know, there, you know, if you're, you know, there's a lot of people out there that think that, you know, truth is relative and that everybody has their truth, right? But at least in, which, which is not true, but at least in that mindset, you believe that, that there are other things other than what you believe that are true. Right? So there aren't multiple truths. There's one truth. God is truth. Truth is objective. But at least in that mindset, you're open to the a possibility, you know, open to somebody else having a different experience and, and that experience being valid. I think a lot of times in the church, um, we take our truth and think it is the truth. Right? So we kind of have that, that, same, that same feeling where we're not uh, seeking the truth and recognizing that, you know, so, you know, in, in the relativistic worldview, you know, you know, there, there are multiple truths and that they're all equally valid. That's not true. You know, you, there's things that are contradictory to each other. They cannot both be true. And, you know, if we are, if we have the spirit of truth within us, we should be seeking that truth, right? That, that spirit of truth within us should be drawing us to the truth. The truth should resonate with us and we should be seeking after it. And, and cleaning out everything that is, is keeping us from coming to that full truth. But I think as Christians sometimes, we think that what we see is all that there is. And we think that we're already, we've already achieved that full understanding and that achieved that full, tr- that full truth. And Paul actually writes about this. You know, he talks about this in, in Corinthians and where, where he writes, you know, now we see it through a glass darkly, but then we will see face to face. But if we want our mirror to be a little bit clearer, then we need to ask the Holy Spirit to be helping with us with that. Because we can't, just as glue could not draw himself out of this pit that he had fallen into, we can't deliver ourselves from this, our own self-deception, right? So um, maybe you think that you're perfectly grounded in what you believe. But I would just, you know, if you have confessed Jesus as Lord of your life, I would challenge you just to put it to the test. If you truly love God, if you're truly seeking after him, you know, lay down everything that you think that is right and is true and just say, you know, God, I I love you. And I thank you that you sent your son to, that Jesus came and died on the cross so that I could be in communion with you. And please remove anything in my life that is blocking that communion. Please show me, show me where I'm in error. And please, please remove the calluses from my heart if they're there. And just be, be open to God working in you, right? So, um, because God loves you and he wants to be in relationship with you. He wants you to lead you out of the pit, even if you, you don't recognize that you're in one. You know, another thing, I watched a, a video by Jack at Rambling Rankin Tour this last week, and he was he was talking about, you know, all the uproar that was going on, and, you know, he said his prayer was uh, 10, that he'd been praying that, because, and it's, if you go and read the psalm, it's about, God, where are you? Please help us. And that is, I think, should be all our prayer. We should recognize that it's only God that can help us. He, one of the things he said was that... He said um, in another context that... Uh, the the arc of history bends towards justice, and as a, as a science teacher, I'll add these are sort of my only words that aren't you know 
Dr. King's ideas in this video, is that the reason that arcs exist, that anything bends in an arc, is because there's a central force pulling it and exerting a force on, on that object to bend it. The Earth curves because of the, the gravitational force of the sun. Rockets and, and object, you know, a, a thrown ball on Earth curve because of the gravitational force of the Earth. And the only thing that, that creates an arc in history bending towards justice is a force exerted by people's actions and choices. And the one thing that um, I would disagree with what he said, like, the, it, it arcs, uh, I think he kind of said that it arcs towards justice because we as people will arc towards justice. And that would be the one thing I would disagree with. I do believe that it arcs towards justice, but I think if you look at what we as human beings do when there's no accountability, then I think that we can't expect justice from that. We get holocausts, we get um, situations where we have uh, authorities giving autopsy reports that say crushing a person's neck was not what actually killed him. That's the kind of thing we get when we look to our own human nature to for justice. We're like, we cover things up and we put up these walls to excuse ourselves. We go to great lengths to excuse ourselves. That is human nature. That arc towards justice is God. It's when people who are oppressed or who see the wrong cry out to God and say, God help us. The arc is God moving in history. If you care at all about what's going on in the world around you, if, if you are a Christian and you believe in Jesus, let's all be crying out to God because he's, a, God help us, because he's the only one that can change our hearts. And let's start with ourselves. Let's just, let's just ask God, like, okay, what is it in me? What, what part of me is having treaty with the enemy? God, I, I lay it all down to you. Like, help me be good. Let's, let's, let's just all do that. But back to the story. So the adventurers have been given this choice. Glue is saying, you have to choose who you're going to sacrifice to free, to be free. And so one of the, one of the, the crew, Gurgi, he offers himself and um, the, Taryn says, Valent Gurgi, murmured Ter Taryn. Indeed, I know you would give up your poor tender head. He panted the frightened Gurgi, but there is no question of that. We must stand together. If Glue wants a life, he shall pay dearly for it. And Fluter once more began digging and chipping at the rock. I agree with you entirely, he said. We must stand as one to the extent that we have any choice at all. So they don't accept this false choice. They decide that they're going to stand together. They're not going to give up anyone, that every single life has value. So um, Ruin actually is he had also offered himself but um he he noticed that that there had been bats in this cavern and they left so they realized that there must have been a way out they found a way they get ruined out and he comes back and and they are able to continue on their journey so this is just really kind of a small part of the story but um this was really to me a very significant part and the other thing that stood out you know this it's an example of how um, circumstances work out to the good and this is what is known you know as providence or the synchronicity of God that God all of these things that we couldn't have expected or that we couldn't have planned that God works out to a good and so you know Ruin gave his own offered his, his own life thinking that he had no other use and he also thinks that his efforts are good for nothing however it was because he slept in the hut that they were in the right place at the right time it was because they fell into the cavern that they learned about the the air the place where the princess was taken and he's the one that noticed the bats left he knows that he's not smart and he's not skilled but he serves with humility to the best that he can and this makes him an unintentional hero he doesn't have an overall plan he doesn't see the big picture but he responds with a true heart to the situation that's right in front of him. And that's all that we're all called to do, is all we're called to do is to respond with a true heart to what's right in front of us. But we can't respond to with a true heart until we have a clean heart. And for that, we need the Holy Spirit. So anyway, those are my thoughts for the week. And I hope that wherever you are, that, that you're safe and the peace of God is with you. Well, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.